question, Paul. Somebody who doesn't know, who was very, very limited knowledge of martial arts. But for me, there's also, and you've touched upon it a few times, the idea of class. And I think here about my only kind of reference point around martial arts, and I think around popular culture, bringing it back to the kind of idea of popular culture, is somebody like Colin McGregor and that kind of um, MMA and whatever you think about him as a martial artist or whether you kind of conceive him in that kind of space or not. But there's very much in his kind of creation of an identity is very much about, you know, working class Dublin lads done well through the discipline that is offered by sport, but specifically around martial arts as well. And I was just wondering if you could expand a little bit, you've talked a little bit about gender and the gendered nature of martial arts within popular culture. I was wondering if you've talked a little bit about class within martial arts and popular culture. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the narrative that a lot of scholars of different stripes have have noted is that the 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 early appeals when when this stuff really became craze and really became a new obsession in the in the 70s the communities that were most besotted with this were the poorer communities working class so in america it was the non-white communities it was the black and hispanic communities uh, but also, but that was mapped in Europe as well as far as as far as I can work out. It was it was a, a it was connected to class in lots of ways. That has changed a lot over time. There has been a gentrification of martial arts without a shadow of a doubt. There are still obviously the the the, the darker and and dingier kind of places that you can go. There's there's the politically dodgy, um, and there's you know there's there's right wing, there's left wing, and all the rest of it. But class is a marker of um, martial arts in much the same, and, and the Venn diagram here, it overlaps with the masculinity. At first, they were, these were kind of originally, in, in inverted commas, um, masculine working class um, practices. So I write about it a little bit in, in the book. So I do write a bit about, about MMA, mixed martial arts and, but specifically with reference to the narratives about them. So there was a very interesting Grace and Perry um, document. He had a series called something like All Man and episode one of the series was called Hard Men. And Grace and Perry, I mean, you know, it's, it's, a, really, it's a really great series and a really great program, but he, he conforms wittingly or unwittingly to a very, very cliched and predictable narrative so he's down south and he's going to look for hard men so where does he go he goes up north right he goes to newcastle and durham but um he paints a, a magnificent picture of of this is, and i write about this in i think the last or penultimate chapter of the book where he paints the people who are in these economically depressed areas who've turned to MMA for something, so some kind of release. These are places where there's been unemployment since their parents, since the, 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 since the shipyards closed, since the mines closed in the 1980s. And these are the generate, these are the children and grandchildren of, of, of um, these hard men, you know, the hard working class men, and they have no outlet for their hardness. And that kind of hardness, that cultural hardness of working class or formerly working class, that's what kind of Manuel Castells would call like the fourth world that has arisen within the, the, the first world of people who have been like economically overstepped by capitalism. There's, there's nothing there for them. What do you do with your hardness? And they turn to MMA to, to fight. But there's a really interesting narrative where you kind of see these people coming into a new form of masculinity by virtue of their, 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 their combative performance. A lot of them know it's performance. Sometimes they'll put makeup on and they adopt these personas and it gives them a kind of joy and it makes them almost into, you know, sort of like, so, so, so Grace and Perry, this kind of, this, this London, London-y transvestite artist Turner Prize winner guy meets, you know, the, the vectors cross in this, in this love of performance and love of, of being, um, of playing around with identities. So that's, in, in this book, I don't write about class so much. It has been written about a lot, but I write about it always in terms of the media narratives about, um, about say, MMA. I think MMA is pretty much mainstream now. Since Conor McGregor, since he became a UFC contender and won the UFC and people in Britain don't know that Ireland isn't in Britain. They thought that it was like a Brit winning the UFC. You know, you know, British people don't know that Dublin isn't in, 
in the United Kingdom, right? Because they speak the same language and everything. Um, and if you look at, so this is the what part of the QROP research that we did. This, when Conor McGregor is in the UFC at first, this is when the Guardian and the broadsheets start to write about the UFC. So he, he mainstreams it in many respects. And this is not long after, you know, you get um, British female athletes winning gold in, in Taekwondo and you get Ronda Rousey being the first, you know, real MMA superstar for women. And the, the UFC and MMA really gets mainstream in the British context between about 2013, I would say, 2013. And you have these interesting dates, 1973, 1993, 2013 seem to be these, if there's a three in it, it's a really important date for martial arts. Uh, these are, the, the, I don't know what, why there's this rhythm. What happened in 2003 that was transformative? I don't know. But um, <clears throat> yeah, class. Thanks, Paul. Sorry, my camera, my, my connection is dropping off. So that's why I have to turn off my camera, but thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Um, we do have a question oh. here. Oh, sorry. Richard, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. I thought I'd, I'd chip in. Um, just talking about social class, the, if you travel around different styles, it does become quite apparent that different social groups seem to be attracted to different martial arts, right? So <clears throat> MMA, Thai boxing, boxing is predominantly working class, uh, sometimes assertively working class. Um, I mean, I did boxing and Thai boxing in Newcastle. And as you say, it's... it's um, strongly and assertively um, exert, um, communicating a view of masculinity. Um, but if you go to an Aikido club or a Tai Chi club, it's a different type of person. And um, I mean, that's part of the appeal of, of the martial arts that it seems to be accommodating all these different people. But it also presents, I think, a definitional problem for what the martial arts are, because um, the practices in these clubs seem to be really starkly different and they have different goals, different ambitions, uh, different tone, different pedagogies and so on. And I wondered what you thought about that. Yeah, I agree completely. I mean, different, it's like Kyle said before, you know, context is king, but you, you can at, at different times kind of plot the, the, almost like the class status of a certain, of a certain practice. And you're right. I mean, I've, I've, I've trained in some overwhelmingly working class clubs and they weren't Tai Chi. When you train Tai Chi, it, it's middle class. It's not, and even if it's not middle class, it's quite well healed, quite genteel, quite civilized, and and so on. Um, because there's, the, the, you know, each each art promises promises a different kind, or or feeds into a different kind of desire. So basically, I think you're completely right. Um, but I think that that spectrum and that 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 constellation changes very much depending on time and place and where you are. You know, Tai Chi isn't always and everywhere a kind of a soft um, old age practice. Um, it's, it, you know, it's not a feminized practice even though it's very, very easy to feminize it. And, you know, media representations and uh, certainly the British press, which is what I looked at, um, mm -hmm. feminize it always. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, but I mean, equally by the same token, MMA, BJJ, these these can be articulated as extremely emancipatory feminist practices. Um, yeah. But yes, it's it's complicated. It's a complex assemblage, uh, and context is king. I'm I'm trying to think of the name of there's a somebody with a PhD in mathematics from Cambridge who was an MMA fighter briefly in the UFC, Rosie, Rosie. Anyway, um, and that was I mean, obviously that in itself was fascinating that this is how she decided her, her career was going to go. Um, and um, unfortunately it didn't last long, but it was it, the, the real significance was not her ability as a fighter. It was her educational background. That was what really people picked up on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, Guy Ritchie's got a black belt in BJJ. I mean, how, how working class can it be? And yeah, I, it's interesting the way that, no, it depends if we want to talk about big associations, because there are, there are, you know, there are different forms of practice and there are different associations. So if you're doing judo, you're doing Kodokan judo. If you're doing jujitsu, you're doing Gracie jujitsu. Um, if you're doing taekwondo, or you're doing ITF, WTF, all these, these, these big structures have brands and they have messages and they have, you know, 
it's a bit like you know serving Guinness in a pub anywhere in the world you have to meet Guinness's standards before you're allowed to serve the stuff and that's the same with many other practices are much more like free radical and could become anything but you're probably unlikely to find uh, like a Gracie Baha Jiu Jitsu club that isn't open and accommodating to people of all sexualities, ethnicities, uh, and, and sexual preferences, and so on. Um, so it very much it very much depends, and the nature of the the institution and the nature of the social context will will play a huge bearing in what that martial art is, you know, perceived to be at that time. Whether it's for thugs or whether it's something that middle class people do when they leave the office, um, or whether it's something just for kids. Or whether it's for old people to seek enlightenment. I mean, if you if you look at the way that I always talk about this, if you look at the way they kind of market taekwondo in South Korea, they they try to make it be everything, like it's for kids, like they're fun little animals, and it's for kids and for teenagers. You can be you can be more athletic than a gymnast, and for 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 adults you can be you can keep virile and strong, and for old people it's a bit like yoga or or qigong or meditation. They want it to be just everything. So, I mean, we're digressing. I don't know if I'm digressing or not, but, but these kind of things um, are very complex and very shifting depending on who's pulling the strings and what the social context um, is, is pressing for things to be. 31 comments. <clears throat> what time is it? What time do we finish quarter past? I, I can keep going. But yeah, so we have like a, we do have a couple of questions that yeah. I know your answer at least in one, but I'm going to ask it anyways. So Jonas is asking: so if we accept the fact that there is no uh, pure martial arts taught in a Western uh, context, does this mean then that we can never really truly learn traditional martial arts? We can never get to to learn the real thing. Uh, right. So if you want to, if you want to learn traditional Shaolin Kung Fu, like you go off to the Shaolin Temple and you will be amply accommodated, right? If you want to learn Capoeira, you can go to Brazil. You want to learn Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, you can go to California or wherever, you know, and, and you will be amply accommodated. The point is that these things are, are, are constantly in flux, but there are certain kind of things that peg them down or there are gravitational forces that pull them in certain directions. Um, and it's often it is the fantasy of the the authentic destination or the authentic strain or style or school or lineage or teacher that that fuels these things. And in the world of martial arts, you see a lot of people who who want to jostle for position and say, I, I am the lineage holder. You wouldn't believe it. But the last thing that guy did on his deathbed was say to me, just me alone, that I am the best and all the other students are losers. So there's a lot of that, that stuff goes on in, in, in martial arts. There are authentic um, um, practices. I mean, you can do authentic Kodokan Judo in any town, just about in any city and anywhere in the world, because it's part of a complex, like you can get an authentic McDonald's uh, more or less anywhere in the world, right? Um, or an authentic Guinness at any airport in the world, right? But it's you have to think not about, you have to kind of de fetishize the idea of the authentic authenticity is very often a red herring. It's like, what do you even think you're getting here and you if you break it down you're after a fantasy that it's like a pre critical fantasy of something that that doesn't really stand up to interrogation, but you often get a hell of a lot more besides you know you you search for. Um, the truth when I started doing Tai Chi. No one really knew for certain that really what we were doing was actually would would square up or how it would line up with what they were doing in Hong Kong or China, because no one in that class had been anywhere else or done anything else. I mean, it turns out then the Internet really ups its game and YouTube comes along and you're like, OK, right. OK, we are, this is Tai Chi. right? It looks right. And we kind of but, you know, we didn't know if it was authentic or the real deal. Um, but then, then the internet comes along, you know, Web 2.0 and, and 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 YouTube in about 2004, and it, and it all of a sudden, it's it's uh, it's open season and, and invention, and you can learn from the internet. But have you authentically learned anything? And everyone said you couldn't authentically learn Tai Chi or Brazilian Jiu Jitsu online. Oh, there's a global pandemic. All the clubs have shut down. Hey, yeah, come and we can you can learn Brazilian Jiu Jitsu from us online, Gracie Baja online. We'll give it to you for free. Just please don't stop doing Jiu Jitsu, right? 
Um, so the authentic constantly, constantly moves. It's a, it's a very, very moving target. And Paul, can I interject something? Yep. So also that sort of connects because everything does come down to Bruce Lee. But I wonder if you kind of have any just thoughts or curious observations, but it's hard for me to even like understand or identify with that kind of fantasy and that authenticity thing. I don't know if it's personality or my entry ways into martial arts, but it's one of those things that's so pervasive that my earlier point and the little discussion about ancient versus contemporary and something that's really old and traditional versus something new and modern, it seems that that drive is so powerful that it even does that to new stuff, which is why those that internal civil war with all the Jeet Kune Do factions was so weird that it's within people's lifetimes that this thing was created. The guy wrote stuff down. We see him do stuff in movies and in little documentary footage. And the whole idea was we're doing this differently from that. And then as soon as this guy dies, now you've got people saying, well, no, this is the authentic Jeet Kune Do stuff. Like what, the authentic, inauthentic stuff? Why are you putting that onto this when it's sort of designed to move away from that? It seems so powerful that it even takes over sort of martial arts ethos and practices that are designed to critique or move away from that. So what is that thing? Why is that thing so pervasive or powerful, that fantasy for authenticity? And why is it so big in martial artists' imagination? Yeah, I, 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 a very long time ago, um, a guy once said to me, and he was a Xing Yi um, expert, and he, you know, he, 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 his whole life was about Xing Yi, and, um, and he said, people like me view our bodies as museums, and we need to keep the knowledge, we need to have it encoded somewhere, we want to transmit it. Like he wasn't about self-defense or about, you know, he was about Xing Yi, what for him was a very old military battlefield Chinese martial art based on animals and da da da. And I never really understood that, but I kind of I kind of do. So when you, you know Bruce Lee dies uh, and you get Dan in Asanda who continues teaching, and people like Ted Wong stop teaching because Bruce Lee had said, please stop teaching. And he respected that. Like Ted Wong was all about like, res re you respect your teachers and you respect what they taught you. And even though Bruce Lee would, would say, we're, what we're doing this year, we won't be doing next year. We won't be doing this. And Dan Inosando kind of ran with that and went, okay, this is a research thing. We're going to work shit out for ourselves. People like Ted Wong were like, but Bruce Lee taught me this and I'm going to teach this because I thought it was really good. I really loved it. I really loved Bruce Lee. And I, I, I'll, for anyone who wants to know what Bruce Lee actually taught, you can come and see me. Um, so I, I think it's just different relations to the whatever. The, it's like different relations to the Bible, different relations to the Quran, different relations to whatever, you know, different ter interpretations of, of the Tao. You know, it's like uh, <laughs> it's just it always is it's always operative and functional in the in the encounter with the text and the engagement with the thing it's like for me i, I, I uh, my martial arts practice has different meanings for me and sometimes i desperately want to maintain absolute fidelity to what i have been taught by another living person who i respect and other times i kind of go well but really couldn't i just, and i sorry i say really again what i mean is actually couldn't i just wouldn't maybe ba 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 and then sometimes people teach you things that you think are really great, but then you deduce that they just made them up themselves when they were playing around in their punch bag. Like there's one guy showed me some really great stuff, which was all about how, how you do this kind of stuff. And, and I was like, I know you just made that up on your punch bag, like by yourself. And it has not been pressure tested in any real situation. Um, so I kind of ditched that, you know, so. Um, but anyway, I mean, I write a little bit about, about the, what do I call it in the book? The the micro ontological inevitability of change or something. And one of the reviewers of the book, when I submitted the book proposal, one of the reviewers went, you see this kind of stuff, reject this book, reject the book. Anyone who's gonna write a phrase like the micro ontological inevitability of change deserves to not be published, right? But then I think that happens all the time. Like I learned Tai Chi, I teach Tai Chi to someone else. I teach, I emphasize different things. It's, there will be micrological changes and displacements. 
um, obviously in the in the days of YouTube, then people can check that and go, hang on a minute, um, that's not right. I was even even being in the situation where like the, a senior instructor was arguing with the grand Sifu and seeing the Sifu guy say, no, you, you, in Tai Chi, you, your elbow never goes higher. It would never be higher than your wrist. And he's got, but I've got a video of you in 1982 and your elbow goes higher. And he's like, but, but I'm here now. And I'm telling you, it never goes higher than your wrist. But I've got the video, and I. But I'm here now. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. <laughs> uh, there is a lot of parallel discussion going on, so I'm just going to copy and send it to you, um, okay. both to Paul and Kyle. And Lynn said a very interesting link on karate tourism. Okay, if you're yeah. interested, um... we have Lauren Griffith here who, who has written books on um, on capoeira tourism and people who go on pilgrimages to these different kinds of destinations. I mean, Lauren um, is, is the person that I would I would really defer to in terms of her uh, research experience on on people who go to pilgrimage to the origin to find the truth, the authentic, the source, the reality. It turns out it's more complicated than that. Mm. But it's a construct. I'm with you. <laughs> there is no authenticity. That's why I talk about legitimacy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Legitimacy. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Okay. Which is a whole other kettle of worms, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Because it seems that, Paul, like that little parable of yours, that also seems like what you talked about the way that you relate to things, like the concept of legitimacy sort of is this a legitimate technique in the sense that it follows this lineage and it has sort of precedent in this art form? Is it legitimate in the sense that this is going to work if I'm in the street, if I'm in competition? That concept of legitimacy, it's so interesting because then that branches off down so many different avenues and then you find so many other different investments from martial artists, different things that show up in media and all that kind of stuff. I mean, there's, there, there are even... I mean, the question, not so much of legitimacy, I think legitimacy is different, but validity. So for example, if, we, if we're talking about something like traditional, like Tai Chi, right? Tai, in Tai Chi, technically, you, you can do any number of variations of any number of things, as long as you respect certain principles, principles of movement and principles of, of energy displacement and, and principles of posture. Anything that you do that doesn't transgress the principles is Tai Chi. So you could be doing Tai Chi while you're kind of hoovering the floor, you know, you're vacuuming the house or, you, you know, that, that, which is what a lot of martial arts films are about, you know, like paint the fence, sand the floor, all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, hang your coat up, drop it on the floor, hang your coat up, drop it, and that becomes the, the technique. Um, so that, that's, that there are questions of validity and legitimacy and authenticity are three very different kind of conceptual universes, I think. <clears throat> So, any last comments? We are already like a few minutes. Oh, a bit late. Um, I can ask you an easy one that doesn't require much contextualization at all. Are martial arts violent or not, Paul? Um, they can be. Context is king, right? <laughs> um, uh, they're about violence. Martial arts are, are, are about violence, I think. And if they're not really about, if they're not about violence, then 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 they very much. Um, move away for me that's a kind of anchoring point um just in that's a subjective personal preference for me um i i believe that probably that would that would for me be if not definitional then certainly a, a supplement or or an aspect that would always be present but not obviously violence is a, is a category that needs to be unpacked and and, and is, is a is a difficult and shifting category they're about combat they're about interacting with other people they're about you know winning and losing and so on so they can be sport it can be about self-defense can be about offense it can be about it can be military but i think there's always that reference to something that could be could be called violence uh, or that could be just combative or could be competition even uh, because i don't necessarily you know there are these things like brazilian jiu-jitsu which which regard themselves as quite soft art so you know that they're kind of they're not pugilistic people don't come out with concussion and brain damage and stuff they're not you can subdue people without violence and that's one of the ideals of brazilian jiu-jitsu is you can sub you can subdue them without damage but if you just inflect that ever so slightly then that person you've just gently subdued is dead right without a bruise on their body 
Um, so is that violent? Yes. Yes, that was a leading question. <laughs> Kyle's right. Sometimes. There's always a ref. I think there's always a reference to that, and there's always a potential, but it, it very much depends on what, what on, on on. It's like you seen like is a hug violent? A hug isn't violent, right? But doesn't it depend entirely on context, consent, how tough you are, whether that person, whether you're, whether you're trying to crush them, whether you're trying to subdue them, whether whether you're forcing yourself upon them, you know, or, or whatever, like a a hug, a kiss is, a, I... is a kiss violent? A kiss is violent. It can be. Can I ask the last question? And that's going to be the last question. And it's, it might be very, very stupid, but I, I saw a comment by Steve here that says that the focus is on unarmed civilian martial practices, which is only a small part of the overall history of martial practice, which made me, me not knowing anything about martial arts wonder, what is it that brings the, the arts to martial arts? Why is it not martial practice? Well, I mean, this is the interesting thing, because once you say martial, I mean, actually, most martial arts have got nothing to do with war, right? I mean, martial means war, right? <laughs> but that we're always dealing with civilian one to one, armed or unarmed combat. It's a complete misnomer. It's it's like it's like why they call that. And I think that we, we are entering a period now where the, the, the hegemony of the term martial arts to kind of characterize the practices that we would group under that umbrella or look at through that optic is fading. People talk about combatives, they talk about combat sports, they talk about self-defense, they talk about these different sorts of um, these different sorts of ways of characterizing their practice. I think that it, it's it's a bit like a lava lamp and for a while the big globule of lava has gone up and that was martial arts and it's fragmenting into different kinds of but those sort of energies are still are still kind of subtending it like for instance in the in the certainly in the british context the longest running discourse the, the kind of substrate is self-defense for a while it's been since the 1970s that's been reinflected and rearticulated under the under the term martial arts but i think that self-defense is a more enduring discourse and that the, that's that can be i think demonstrated with lots of different forms of evidence um but martial arts is a massive misnomer for, for what we're dealing with so i can see that steve disagrees and he's shaking his head and that's when if we were in a normal context we would go to the pub and you would, would resolve that at the pub uh, <laughs> because we have run out of time yeah uh, I mean, it's, so it's a com it's definitely an ongoing conversation. I mean, my statement here is just a statement in, in the midst of many contradictory statements. And I know that I'm, I'm always fighting an uphill battle when I'm arguing these things. So I, I'm, I'm not I'm not articulating a mainstream position here. So we have run out of time. We are 15 minutes uh, uh, late, but the conversation was good and lively, both the discussion and the discussion on the chat. Um, so thank you both. Thank you, Kyle, for agreeing to be the discussion. Thank you, Paul, for presenting your book. Thank you. Really, really nice. Thank you very uh, much. I had fun. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you for the invitation. The one positive from being on Zoom is I can do a Cardiff research seminar from my home in Chicago. So thank you for the invitation and thank you to other people for watching. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you. Send me the chat. Thank you. Yes, I will do it. Thank you. Okay, cheers. Thank you so much.